Well, welcome, 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 everyone. We are nearing the end of our series. This is the penultimate week. One of my favorite words, by the way, penultimate, which means the thing before the last thing. Um, so just a brief um, 30,000 feet overview of our stages of faith that we've gone through so far. Um, we began with an awareness of God that comes from a knowing of your deep need or an acknowledgement of some deep awe of the ultimate incredible bigness of all things. Um, we find ourselves communities or leaders or authors or gurus, pastors, whatever it may be, whose words resonate with that deep knowing which we have found in step one, and we latch ourselves on to them as a way of uh, growing our roots deeper into the soil. And once we have sufficiently dug down into that soil, we feel confident, we feel set and ready in this, we tend to start to move outward as well, no longer needing to simply just be fed, but now feeling enabled to feed others, to serve others as well. Um, we move into this life of doing, this productive life, where many of us can stay for a very long time, happy, healthy, well, good. Um, should say, another way of looking at this diagram, I should have said before, um, is the reason why it's in this, in this way, uh, we could just put God in the middle as well, in that in each one of these stages, you have equal access to God. These aren't like um, getting closer, climbing a stairway to heaven or something like that, that God is present in different ways to us in all of these stages and that you should rejoice wherever it is that you find yourself. So once um, we have been in this stage, those of us who are really committed to seeking, to knowing, to doing, especially those who are full of zeal um, for God and for their community in that stage often find the limits of that stage of that way of being. And some of us find that in times of transition, in times of crisis, in times of upheaval, perhaps a global pandemic, the birth of a child, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, or just a slow, long process of spiritual boredom in which we've just kind of reached all the edges of this one and we say, wait, that's it? I kind of thought there was more to this. And that leads us to then go inward, to look um, deeply within ourselves at, the, um, at what we've internalized in this. And, and as you look within and you start to kind of take apart all the little things that you took for granted earlier on, um, we tend to hit a wall, which is where we were last week. That wall is constructed of all of the things that hinder our progress. Um, it is every bit as much psychological as it is spiritual. Um, we need to know ourselves. We need to um, approach the parts of our psyche that we'd rather not approach. We need God to be there in that moment to humble us, to be with us, and to strengthen us to move through. In many cases, there is a kind of necessary dying in that wall step in the way that um, a snake sheds its skin when it outgrows it. Um, I know for me, it was um, this, the first time through, was a long and painstaking process in stage four of trying to fake it through this faith thing and pretending like I still believed things that I truly deep down inside didn't and it wasn't until I went to college and everything fell apart and I was nearly suicidal and lost everything that I had. And I one day finally admitted while sitting in a Starbucks that I didn't actually believe in God. And I had not actually believed in God for a long time. And that I was going through the motions because it's all I ever knew. And I was worried about losing my family and my friends because of that. And when I admitted to myself the thing that I had been hiding from myself, the wall fell down. And it, that's the, the period then between admitting I was an atheist to meeting the living God was only a couple of months at that point. So the process had been years of, of inward um, journeying, journeying inward. 
But then what's on the other side of the wall? Once we have done that, that work, once we have received that grace, what awaits us? Why, why go through this pain, this suffering? I, some folks have asked in previous sessions, why not just stay sort of blissfully um, a part of the religious group and just get together and do your Christmas carols and your bake sales and all of the fun, happy, good things and don't even worry about going deeper. If, if God can be met here and here and here, why bother? Well, because this part over here, my goodness gracious, is very hard to explain just how um, transcendent these uh, stages are. <coughs> in, in this stage, in stage five, you can think of this as a, uh, as a bear emerging at, from its cave after hibernation. It opens its eyes, it walks outside, the world looks different. Time has passed, the leaves are changed, the bear feels different, it has different desires, it has grown in its, uh, in its cave. When you have met your brokenness, when you have seen your emptiness, when you have seen all of your weakness down here, you've faced it head on, you've acknowledged it, you've seen all of your doubts and fears, and then God has still met you there and filled you with an abiding sense of love anyway, or maybe even because of your flaws. Um, it's a little bit like all of those times in scripture where it talks about filling your cup to overflowing that you just can't help it, that you fill it up so much that it pours out, and then you want to, you want to spread that outward. You want to go out to the world and give some of that acceptance and love out. You start to see people who are struggling in stage four, and you want to take their hand and bring them through because you know the love and acceptance that you've received. But... It is hard to really, truly describe what is happening inside of a person um, and how that is different than what we talked about here. Um, anyone who has had a deep and personal experience with the divine knows that it is a deep and personal experience and in many ways transcends the ability to communicate. Um, it's a little bit like... A, trying to describe color to a dog um, or explain what sweet tastes like to somebody who hasn't tasted sweet in two years. Um, it's hard to explain a spiritual experience without sounding crazy. <laughs> so many of us don't even try. So we have to use a lot of metaphors for this. Um, and so forgive me if it's a little more ethereal <laughs> than the previous stages and less concrete. Uh, that is kind of a part of it. <clears throat> but if you have been through the, those stages in your faith journey, or if you ever are in those stages, I pray that you will understand and you'll go, oh yes, that's, that, is, that is very hard to put into words. <clears throat> so in stage five, to try to put some words to it, there is a sort of peaceful urgency, a peaceful urgency, peaceful in that it is grounded in love, it is grounded in God's love. You've been through the fire, <clears throat> you've been tested, tempered, melted down, reformed, and you have experienced that abiding love. And so there's a sort of peace that comes from that, in which you are unshakable. Things don't bother you quite as much. The old things of the world eh, are just whatever. Things like money and success, and they don't really bother you. When things go wrong, well, you kind of know deep in your heart that things are going to be okay. Um, sometimes when we read or hear things from people at this stage, they seem naive overly optimistic. We think you've got your head in the clouds. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, 
one of my favorite spiritual writers, Julian of Norwich. Um, she has a phrase that is kind of my mantra that I repeat to myself, that all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things will be well. And uh, that sounds cheap, doesn't it? That, that just sounds like, put a smile on your face and everything's going to work out fine. Um, and it, for some, that might be just cheap, hopeful optimism. But for somebody like her, who has been through this process, who's been tempered by fire, literally almost dying of the plague, um, when she says it, when it's deeply grounded in this unshakable love that it, it hits differently. I think too of uh, St. Teresa of Avila from a uh, 16th century Spanish um, nun, mystic, reformer, all around incredible woman. She has a famous prayer that I also repeat to myself sometimes as a kind of mantra. Let nothing disturb you, let nothing frighten you. All things are passing away. God never changes, patience obtains all things. Whoever has God lacks nothing, God alone suffices. For someone who has been through it, those words ring, they resonate in a different kind of a way. Because this is a faith that is so rooted in love, that's been so tempered by fire, that they actually believe this. That's where the peace comes from. I said a peaceful urgency. The urgency in that having been through hell, there's gratitude to God and a desire to just pour that out on everyone around you, to spread that love around the place. Now this, like I said, looks a lot like stage three, right? Where we've been filled up by our church or wherever it is, and now we want to share what we've been given with the rest of the, of the world. But the rooting is deeper. It's not connected with any worldly group or teacher or ideology. It's connected directly to the source of being. So I have to give you a little warning about this stage before you attempt um, to move through these cycles. The stage will potentially ruin your life, mess things up pretty severely for you. So enter at your own caution. You see, with your roots dug so deeply in God's love and acceptance, the cares of the world just kind of naturally matter less to you. So things like your job, your status, your finances, your esteem, success, comfort, all the things that we normally strive towards and think about and work towards, they start to mean less and less. And not all at once, but we will begin to feel our soul's deepest longing. Our soul's deepest longing. What it is that makes us feel the most alive. And then one day, we'll find the place where our deepest longing and the world's deep need intersect. Where our deepest longing and the world's deep need intersect. And that, my friends, is your calling your vocation. That is a sacred and a holy place. And if you were to dive into that, well, that'll cost you some of your old hopes and dreams. That may cost you some friends who don't understand, or some family. That might end up losing your home, your career, your savings, your comfort. Um, sorry, Jesus said, following him would be uh, difficult. <laughs> you need to pick up your cross and carry him. Um, pick up your cross and follow him, not carry him. <laughs> In uh, In earlier stages, um, we think about uh, little changes. 
And, you know, most of the time when I'm preaching a sermon, I'm preaching to folks who are not here, assuming most people kind of are generally somewhere in one through four. And so when I suggest things to people um, as, as takeaways, they're often small, easily doable things of, of, you know, calling one person or donating to this or, you know, little, little tiny things. Once you're past this and you're in this place of deep love and connection with God, when you've been utterly transformed, those things will seem just like nothing. Those are the things you do just because you're alive. God will be calling you to do things that will be bigger, that will be more costly um, in whatever way that looks like for you. But at the same time, you will be more equipped than ever. Um, you will find yourself being able to love deeper than you've loved before, to be able to uh, give more joyfully than you've ever given before, to have more patience, to have more strength, to have more tolerance, to be able to do things that you didn't think you were able to do before. Um, there's not a whole lot of burnout when you're in this stage because you're connected to the source. God might... Uh, be calling you to something bigger. I think about the rich young ruler that Jesus met along the way, and he said, Jesus, what do I have to do to earn salvation? And Jesus said, well, love God, love your neighbor. He says, great, I do those things. And he said, okay, um, follow all the commandments. Great, I've done those things too. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and follow me. And he couldn't do it. And he went home sad because he knew that he couldn't do it. He couldn't make the big sacrifice. But then when Jesus showed Zacchaeus in the next chapter, love, support, acceptance for who he was, he instantly, without being asked, gave back everything he had cheated from people, like fourfold, donated half of everything he owned to the poor, and then followed Jesus right away. Because he knew that depth of love, he'd been met in his darkness by Jesus, and that was the only logical thing that made any sense to him after that. There's a wonderful story um, from the Desert Fathers. So the Desert Fathers were um, roughly 5th, 6th century. Um, this was when uh, Constantine became a Christian, the Roman um, emperor. Christianity went from being an outlawed religion to being the official religion of the empire, which meant that they were no longer persecuted, but suddenly there's money and power and status in the church, and the church starts to lose its soul the way that the church does. And whenever the church starts to lose its soul, people leave and they go out into the margins and they, they find God back in the wilderness again. And this is what the, the first monastic movement, these these, uh, we call them the desert fathers and mothers because they went out into the desert and lived in caves and had these little communes and whatnot. And so one day, as the story goes, Abbot Lot, so one of the, one of the monastic folks named Lot, came to Abbot Joseph. And he said, Abbot Joseph, what should I do? I follow my little rule of life. I do my little fast. I say my little prayers. I give my alms to the poor. I do what I am. I follow the law of God as best as I am able to do. What else can I do to attain um, to attain unity with God? And Abbot Joseph looked at him with kindness in his eyes, and he held out his hands which became consumed by flames, and he said, why not be utterly changed into fire? The point being, Lot was coming in there saying, look, I've, I've, I, do, I do my little thing. I got this little thing going. I do this thing, I do this thing, I do this thing. He's giving, he's giving bits and pieces of his soul, of his life, and he's wondering why he's not feeling that depth of connection, why he's not quite getting it like the other ones are. And Joseph says, huh, my goodness, it's not enough. Why would, you, why would you play around with this thing? Why not be utterly consumed by it? Why, why not? 
Why not dive in head first? So more than anything in my life, I want to help people who are stuck here because I've been there for so long and I've known the transformational power that happens here, that awakening, that depth of knowing and loving and living. And I know the freedom and the power that comes out that other side. I know what a transformed a life looks like, one that is utterly consumed by fire. I know what that looks like. And I think if the world had more people who had been utterly changed into fire, who who were living in through their, their, uh, their deepest longings, who were fully alive to the world, my goodness, what difference we could make in the world. Um, and so one of the main reasons that I became a pastor in the first place, <laughs> because I want to see the world set ablaze by people who are so rooted in love that they, uh, they can't help but spread that around them. So I'm going to take some time here, now that I've done my best to try to explain what that looks like, and dream a little bit with you, to ask you if you could not fail, what would you do? What would bring your soul the most fulfillment? Or, put more specifically, the question I always ask people in the new members' classes. If I gave you all the volunteers you needed and I gave you some funds from the church, what would you do? First thing that comes to my mind to see would be to get the volunteers together and say, what should we do? Not just my idea. We got some money. You're here. You want to help. What should we collectively, what should we do? I guess I don't have enough confidence that you said I can fail, but I don't know that I have got to have the vision to see that item. But with the help of others, maybe we can see the vision. Okay, very practical answer. But I'm interested in what's what stirs your soul. Volunteers in this case, we're not trying to do the most good. We're trying to support you in your deep longing, in the thing that um, <clears throat> would bless your soul enough. I have reservations on what my abilities to really change things would be. Interesting because you use the term failure, and I'm doing some writing about my life, and I just spend a lot of time talking about my failures. 
those things that uh, didn't work out. Uh, but in each case, when it didn't work out, I learned something. So I don't know whether they're failures. But if I had a, an ability to change anything, it would be how we, each human being, begins to see every other human being as worthy. Uh, their life having worth and value, and that we have so much more in common than the things that appear to be pulling us apart. So it's unattainable in, in the sense of, of, of money or anything else, but um, it would be something that would have significant meaning for me. Something that Sam DeWald and I dreamed about years and years and years ago is um, gathering all of the churches in the area, um, or at least the ones who used to call Schwartzwald home, the two Schwartzwalds and us, and maybe even the ones in Mount Penn, to gather our resources and to purchase the old community center right here, the old brick building which is just now owned by one person who lives there who tried to turn it into condos, but there's no parking, and so he couldn't. Um, to buy that building, to do all of the repairs and renovations that it needs to get back to what it was, and to have a collective place for a, a hub for ministry, to have a place where there could be um, kind of like our, our clothing swap, but all year round, a clothing bank, a, a permanent food bank, a, um, a place for people to meet, a place for groups to reopen the bowling alley down there, to have a, uh, a, a, a cafe, to have a space where people can come together, people from the different churches that all live in our own little silos and refuse to do anything with one another, to have a place then that is a third space that is not our precious buildings, but that is outward that we can work together and realize that we are the body of Christ together. That was a dream that Sam and I had together that uh, no other churches in the area shared. Well, that's a great dream, but if the guy couldn't have parking spaces to make apartments, how are people going to be able to come there unless they walk? See, now, I told you. If you couldn't fail, what would you dream? <laughs> well, yeah, but, you know. We're not at the failing stage yet. Well, We're just I, I understand that, but, you know, you had two statements there. One said the guy couldn't make apartments because there was no parking, but yet you want to have a space. You have to maybe purchase a bunch of buildings and tear them down so you can build a parking lot. Or use our parking lot here at the church like we did for a while back in the day. There's always a way in the wilderness. This exercise is less about um, planning the future and more about revealing where what your deepest longing is. And so for me, that energized me to talk to Sam about that, to dream about it, because my deepest longing is to bring people together who are at odds, or who don't recognize how much they have in common and how much they can do together. I think that's a great idea, you know, listening to it. And uh, I think that would be something that we should try to do. Uh, you know, getting over the, you know, people would have to start walking if it was to try to unite the community a little bit, you know, instead of driving. You have a lot of residents around, you know, that could, you know, they could really take advantage of it. But in that same frame, framework with, with check reservation, you could have a parking area here and a little shovel box that was running back and forth constantly. So uh, that's only for us old guys who can't walk. Mm. Yeah, well, that, that's true, and uh, there are a lot of people that are, are wouldn't be interested in walking. But uh, it, it, there's a solution to everything. Uh, it's not always an easy solution, but if you're investing as much, the little shovel. Um, might be an option. What else might you do if you knew that you couldn't fail?
It's hard to dream without limits. We're not used to it. We're used to, to, to knowing the ways that things aren't going to work. I understand that. I get that in my gut. Kind of a selfish thing for my soul would be to take these people and the, the funds that were provided and somehow use that to bring some young people into this church. Uh, we need, if we don't, we won't be here in some time in the future. Uh, and I don't know how that is and what would need to be done and that's what the group's going to do is to help make that happen. But to see the church full and people in their 20s and 30s and their families and stuff here rather than people in their 70s and 80s would be really uplifting. So I hear a, a longing to um, I don't want to say to preserve the institution but to um, to help the, the church that you have loved to survive and thrive and continue. Um, and spread the faith. Mm -hmm. Those people are not going to church somewhere else, then uh, we get a twofer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, folks aren't going to church anywhere at all. I really, I was really, uh, uh, what, a couple months ago when we were over there, we, we were talking about church and uh, why younger people don't come to church and Kathy just said she's like well how many of your kids come go to are, are part of a church how many of your children around the room and it's like she's like I know mine doesn't <laughs> what about what about everyone else's and then everyone kind of around the room sheepishly was like well no, no I wish they did I wish that kind of a little bit that this person one of mine is and kind of went around sheepishly admitting then that this is something that is not just like a theoretical issue of young people in churches, but is something that maybe you as parents feel deeply as well. Um, I think some of that is because of our normal society. Because children grow up and they all over the United States or whatever. It's not like they stay in the same community like people used to. Yeah, stay around their family. I'm not making excuses. <laughs> well, but then they don't join churches wherever they are. Yeah, that's how, I guess we don't we don't always know what they do. Uh -huh. Maybe the consideration would be change that thought around to the fact to ask the question what is it that people will find of real value that brings them in back into the church what it, apparently we're lacking or the whole faith communities are lacking the ability to get into the individual's life and offer something that has value for them to give up their time and energy to the church. Uh, apparently, we lost that. And how we get it back? Yeah, have we done a good job of seeking out those who are not and figuring, asking them what their heart's deepest longing is? Is there some disconnect there where we know our soul's deepest longing, which is being met? In church and then we assume that our soul's deepest longing is the same as their soul's deepest longing and wonder then maybe the disconnect is they just don't know about us <clears throat> instead of what are we missing um, with a whole generation or two or some kind of even three Gen X was kind of the first ones to start to pull away from the church in big numbers anyway I guess we're what? Gen X, Y, Z. Now we're four generations from that. Goodness gracious. People keep being born. We need a sales manager. A sales manager. 
sales department, division, whatever. Mm. And you just sell all the product. <laughs> I mean, that's seriously. Mm. You, you got to make them aware of what it is and how wonderful it is, and and here's how you get it. And it's half the price. That's half the price. Half off salvation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something I wonder. If this is something, if what goes on in church is something that is so life changing, that does matter so much, why don't we want more people to be a part? Why don't we proactively seek to get more people a part of it? Like if we truly believe that this is something that is amazing, then we want other people to experience it. When I find a new restaurant that I just love, I, oh, I, I'm on Facebook right away. Like, oh my goodness, you all need to come try this place. Somebody comes and visits, I'm like, I know where I'm taking you. You know, like we proselytize food very easily, but not so much our faith communities. Which then, I don't know, maybe there's something in there to look deeply, to deconstruct as to maybe why we don't feel that urgency to bring more people in. Maybe we don't actually feel as deeply connected as we thought we did. Um, or maybe there's some kind of a fear that's holding us back from that. I don't know what it is in your life. I know that there have been some people in my experience here um, who have just, everywhere they go, they're like, oh, let me tell you about my church. <laughs> um, they, um, yeah. I, I'm kind of going back because I had reservations about sharing because I have no clue how it would feel. I think my deepest longing would be healing. Mm. Um, you know, there's so much brokenness and, um, you know, both physical and mental conditions that people can't find answers for. I feel like, um, you know, that's a big need. Um, I certainly know in Jesus' time that people flocked to Jesus because he healed, you know, that was a big draw. Mm. Um, but I have absolutely no idea how you would go about doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's a conversation for another day of the how, but the what, the what is something that exposes something deep within you. So I'm glad you shared. Well, my prayer for you all is that you in the quiet spaces this week are able to discern your soul's deepest longing. And as you do, and as you learn to hold on to that, um, untempered by the concerns of practicality, may you start to see where your soul's deepest longing and the world's deep need intersect. It's a phrase I think it was Frederick Buechner said first. Your soul's deepest longing, the world's deep need, where they intersect, because that place, that's your vocation, that's your calling. And that might mean I need to quit my job and <laughs> go do this thing. I need to go become a, a, a missionary somewhere, you know, something, something crazy. Or it might just mean um, wow, I need to start uh, volunteering to drive people places or to work for Meals on Wheels. I need to bring in a refugee to live in my home. I need to write like whatever that looks like for you. My prayer is that you would be so rooted in the knowledge of God's ever and abiding love that you would find the strength to do that thing to step out onto the waters and to take a big chance that you might be utterly transformed into fire and understand um, the peace that comes from that. Um, we'll make a sort of uh, subtle transition next week into stage six. It's not a huge transition here. I probably should have made these closer together. Um, <clears throat> It's a subtle transition, but it's a beautiful one. 
um, and that will complete our first round through. And we'll talk next week about what it then looks like to cycle back around through here. Um, May I ask a question about something you said earlier? Yeah. You talked you talk in terms of you giving us caution about moving because of the risks in it and what you had to give up. And you said one of the things you may have to give up is hope. And uh, that concerned me. Your old hopes and dreams is how I put it. Yes. Like the your dream. previous ones. Okay. Oh. Like before I was so deeply connected to God, uh, my, my hopes and dreams were to one day own my own business and, um, you know, become a millionaire. My, my hopes were that I would, uh, you know, be able to retire early and buy an RV and live comfortably out on the road. Like, that may have been your early hopes and dreams, but um, likely God will mess that up for you. So it's okay to replace it with new hopes. Oh sure. Okay. Oh my goodness. Yeah, hope is a uh, hope is one of the big three, right? Faith, hope, and love. Right. Um, that's. I wish I could remember the quote off the top of my head um, from Shane Claiborne that always that stuck with me from the Irresistible Revolution. That uh, he talks about how people always say that God, that Jesus saved them from their old life, but he said, Jesus ruined my old life. <laughs> I'd be so much, life would be so much easier if I never met Jesus in any kind of real way. I got hung up on the, the giving up your, your, you might cost you your job and your, uh, your position and, and your whatever. That could affect a lot of other people. I mean, if you've got a family and they need income and they need the rent to be made and food and whatever, and you're saying, well, I don't really need to work. I'm, God will take care of it. And maybe your faith thinks, tells you that's going to happen. God will take care of it. But what if it doesn't? I mean, and, and you, you lose that home and you've got children there at home. Don't you have responsibility to them also? I mean, well, I, I hope you don't hear me saying that God is calling people in this stage to uh, abandon everything um, willy-nilly and run off into the woods or something that you know say you are a married man with three children and you work a nine to five job in sales and you get a good salary and you're taking care of your family and you feel deeply that God has now called you into um, say uh, resettling uh, refugees and you can't get it out of your head like God still wants you to take care of your family God will provide a way to do those things um, it's important that you take the first steps right like when when God called uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son and he went up the mountain trusting that God would provide a sacrifice. And God did provide a sacrifice, and it wasn't Isaac. Because um, I think that the God would, who calls you to it will guide you through it, um, and that you would move forward with a wisdom um, and not just reckless abandon. You know, It might cost you things, and it might, your family might have to sacrifice for some time. Right? You may need to downsize your home, your kids, you know, maybe don't, uh, you don't go on big lavish vacations, but you trust that it will all be the better for it. Um, you just use terms like you may lose your home, you may lose your friend, family and friends, and all that in your, in your, your comments earlier. I, I took that literally. Well, folks tend to not understand if uh, when, when you've had an encounter, a true encounter with the divine, folks start to think you're crazy. And so if you're from a world that doesn't understand that at all and you're moving away out of that, then folks might think, oh, wow, this guy's changed. I don't know if I, I can spend time with him anymore. 
he doesn't, uh, he won't just have drinks and gossip about folks with me anymore. And yeah. uh, is there a good, uh, like a resource of like the divine experiences that people have experienced, like they, that you found? Like, I'm just like, I, like, I don't know if I had one, but like, I just don't know what I'm looking for, you mm -hmm. know? Like, I, I, from an early age, like, got saved as a five year old and did the whole you you got saved you grew up in the church you did all of that stuff so i'm like i know i felt compelled to not lie to the teacher when she asked if i was saved was that a god moment i don't know but um mm. like as an adult i'm like all right god do the thing go ahead show me the the pizzazz you know I'm like i don't know like is there <laughs> i don't know what i'm looking for i know it's, it'd be very individual for everyone but i I can't think of so many times where I've been like, all right, God, if you're real, then give me a flash of light. Show me an angel. The God, if you're real, I want to hear a car horn in three, two, one. Nope. <laughs> Nothing. It's just one of the ways I disproved God. Uh, um, uh, I think it's Teresa of Avila in the interior castle talks about her visions and her experiences and how they are, um, she treasures them, but she also kind of is annoyed by them because then she's worried that um, her faith and connection will be contingent on them. You know, like she wants, she wants to find a faith that doesn't need that. And she's, she's having a hard time because she keeps having visions. And it's funny, the, the less she wants them, the more she gets them. Um, but the, I, I don't know of a single compendium of people's like spiritual experiences because they are all so very different. Have you read um, Mike McCard's book? You know Science Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Finding God in the Waves. He has a really interesting yeah. deconstruction and then experience, spiritual experience that was like really unique, I think. Um, if you want my copy, I have it in my office. Okay. Great. So. All right. Well, friends. Um, thank you for your time, for your sharing. Um, just a heads up, I'll give you all a little forewarning. I'm going to ask the congregation to do a little dreaming today as well. So you can feel free to share some of the things you've already said today because you've already had a chance to think about it. Um, today's a day for dreaming. This is the I have a dream moment. Uh, not, not by that name, yeah. but similar, yes. Okay.